from a bunch of different places. And I found, when because they refunded me money after I paid my required amount, and I said, why did you send this to me? And it was for my inpatient gallbladder surgery. I'll share with everybody. And they had charged you guys, and you had paid. And I did a war dance on their office, and I said, I don't want to go to Leavenworth. Thank you. <laughs> and we're not talking the nice place in the mountains of Washington. We're talking Kansas. And I said, so you will reverse this. And they fought me on it. And they said, well, because we had to do an anesthesiologist on you, and you have a covered lung condition. They charged the entire gallbladder surgery, including the day state hospital to you, and you paid it. So... What's the proper way, because I know they're doing this with, because Hanford's a big, and I know they're getting away with this in other areas. What can we do? <laughs> can everybody look at Shelby? <laughs> uh, you should write up a little bit of uh, information about what you know and send it in to us, and we might hand that off to our Inspector General to see what's going on. Because I just saw that for I'm a veteran and I went in for a VA thing. They just build Blue Cross for what they also build the Veterans Administration for. Oh, well, that'll get them into something. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, so I know it's a it's a pattern yes. with them. I, I would say you know, and we we get wind of all kinds of squirrely things going on, and and you know we do have ongoing investigations right now on a variety of issues with regard to medical billing and home health care and that sort of stuff. Um, if you are aware of situations that you think are dubious, more than likely there is something strange going on that we need to know about. Well, and ACS isn't going to catch everything because of that. They're not always going to know that they're being billed somewhere else. So well, I, that's I, kind of stuff that they're not going to I had asked this a year ago, and we're going to come up with some, some way of reporting. We still <coughs> haven't seen that. You know, we don't have a hotline for fraud yet for this program, right? So what is the procedure under this program? Because as an AR, I see funky things going on with Yeah, and, well, and you know, the other thing too is that this, I also want to caution everybody in this room in saying that what you look at and think is fraudulent, it, it might not be. It might just be that's the way the rules are. There is a very confusing process. But if you're looking at something and you're saying this is, this is strange or weird, notify us and we generally will have lots of folks take a look at it and then they'll decide whether it's going to go up through the chain because they, they look at a lot of different things. They look at the amount of money that's involved, it's a, it's, there's a lot of criteria that they look at to determine it. And don't forget, a lot of our bills are paid automatically, so we're in this mode where we pay it. We don't have people manually checking every single one of these bills. But where we have evidence of problems, like when we get reports of potential fraud or double billing or misuse of services or whatever, um, we'll take a look at it. But you know, when we look at it, sometimes it's a grieved individual who had some beef with whoever. So we have to be very careful with it. So just because you think it's fraud, mm -hmm. be, I never try to think of anything as fraud until I look at it and say, absolutely, 100%, that looks really shady. Um, and that's why we send it to the OIG. Because we're not... Uh, you can send it to You can send it to us and we'll take a look at it. Um, Could you... Um, I, I have a question about BES. It's not an actual illness, mm -hmm. right? So, but it, there is a pretty, very extensive treatment suite for BES. Right. Um, Are you talking about Burlington? Yeah, yeah. 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 sensitization. Okay. Um, who helped create that treatment suite, and are they benefiting from a treatment suite like that? No, yeah, because all the treatment who suites. Who created are, it? All of our treatment suites are, are developed by our medical director in the program. And, and the OWCP. original treatment suites were developed by our director of OWCP for medical, our medical director for OWCP, which is our umbrella agency. Um, the the the. the CBD and Berlin sensitivity were linked so tightly at some point that we decided that some of the costs of the testing for CBD would be covered under Berlin sensitivity because they were saying, we have been approved for Berlin sensitivity, you're doing medical monitoring, I need to run these certain tests. So some of the treatment suites will cover more things that might be more related to CBD because it's considered testing to determine if they have CBD. So that is the decision that we made in consultation with our medical group. At and does that mean unlimited amounts of um, beryllium sensitization tests after two positives? It you means that we will unlimited if a physician is, 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 has diagnosed beryllium sensitivity and that physician who's treating the patient tells us this person needs something, then we're likely going to pay it, yes. Because the doctor's asking for their, their patient. We're not going to say, no, doctor, you're wrong. You don't need that. We get a lot of trouble from you guys. Yeah, they do that all the time. So, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I, 
we can't have, have it both ways here. My father <laughs> was told we couldn't get a heart on it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, after two positive B reads, or I mean two positive well, real M sensitization tests, and there's not one study saying that you need more than that. Stephanie, we will approve will the doctor Will you guys recommends. pay uh, an unlimited amount of real M sensitization tests? We will doctor. pay what the doctor prescribes. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're we're yeah, we're we're at the mercy of the physician who's prescribing it, and so that's that's what we do. Don. Yes, and on the, the treatment suites, uh, who does the treatment suites now? And is there any way that we can say that now that this is uh, ICD nine code should be added to this particular treatment suite? And you know, here's some evidence and everything for you, his medical and everything. So then that can be added. And they, to the we suite. look at those individually. Like Fay, I think Fay's had some experience. Yeah, that. we've had discussions. Yeah, because you know, it's like the same thing with the drug, the drug issues. Mm -hmm. With with drugs that are prescribed for one thing, that they're not really classified to treat, but physicians do it. So we have to make modifications to the treatment suite. So it's possible. The other cautionary thing I'll say about that is sometimes what you're talking about is treatment for a consequential illness, mm -hmm. which is something related, but it's not do specifically to that primary illness, it's actually we've got to accept some other new component to allow for that particular service to be paid. So let me get back into this so we can get through this and then I'm leaving and Rachel's going to take her out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for home health care, uh, home health care is a great, great benefit under our program. We have very almost no restrictions on home health care like other federal programs. Uh, it is basically um, a uh, process by which somebody can get uh, an, um, a nurse or a, a personal care assistant into the into their home to help with activities of daily living, um, functional assistance when you have somebody that's severely disabled because of an illness or whatever. Um, but it's a very complicated process, and as the years have gone by, gotten much more complicated and much more fraught with all kinds of uh, issues. Um, Nonetheless, we're working through uh, this process, and I think that we've sort of, in the past year or so, we've really sort of focused a little bit more attention on strengthening our review of these requests, because they are something that does require pre-approval. Um, we do need to have requests for home health care by a um, physician or the claimant or the authorized rep, um, and we need to know what's going on. This is the most important thing here. Um, when you need somebody to come into your home to help you with whatever, the doctor needs to explain what is it you need help with and why because of your accepted illness? And again, it's a matter of the doctor's rationalization of the opinion. A justification as to why you need a person to come into your home and help you with something. Um, and that's where we end up with a lot of issues because we, we ask questions about, you know, why do you need a nurse to come in there every single day for this illness where all the nurses, be, all we're being told is the nurse is coming in to, you know, look at you and monitor you. Okay, why do you need an RN to do that? Why can't we have a PCA? Or why can't we have some other level of uh, service provider come in and do that? Why does it need to occur for such a lengthy period of time each day? Um, so as long as the doctor's providing some sort of explanation and rationalization and justification, that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, the other thing is that you know when we get a prescription for a home health care evaluation, what we're doing is just basically authorizing a provider to come into the home to do an assessment that is going to then be provided to the physician. The physician is not obligated to take that assessment and say that's what you need. Uh, the physician is at complete discretion to decide whatever the level of care he or she thinks is appropriate for that patient based on the assessment by the provider and also interview with the patient, medical exam, and that sort of thing. Um, the important thing in this entire process is that if you're going to request the service, make sure you have the medical documentation to substantiate and justify it. Uh, that's where we run into the most kind of problems, um, is the physician not explaining why he or she thinks this person needs whatever level of care is being prescribed. Um, <clears throat> and that's this right here. The evaluation for home health care is always going to be evaluated by the claims examiner. So make sure you're, you've you got to convince the claims examiner that the care is needed and medically justified. Um, any kind of insufficiency in the documentation is going to trigger development. This can occur at the initial evaluation stage, or this can occur oftentimes after we do an initial authorization and we start getting evidence that that person's prescribed level of care isn't matching up with that person's really able of doing. So in other words, when we see nursing notes saying, I was cleaning windows, making meals, doing this and that, and then we find out that the claimant was playing golf all day long, that's where we start having problems and we start having to get clarification. Um, I think the key thing is just understanding that, you know, medical evidence is the key. Medical evidence is the key. <laughs> that's that's the one thing that, that trips, up, trips up a lot of these homes.
this guy is fully functional, he's able to get out of the home, he's able to drive, or she is able to do whatever, and yet we're going to request for 12 hours of uh, RN care a day. And then, you know, what is the rationalization for that? And then we go back and look at the medical documentation, and it's from a physician who's completely unaffiliated with the case, or stuff like that. That tends to make it very complicated for us to figure out what's going on. Um, we have been having a lot of issues recently with a lot of uh, infighting between uh, new home health care providers. A lot of providers are entering into the field of providing home health care for our energy employee claims. Um, what I'm seeing out west mostly are nurses that are working for these companies are spinning off and making their, just starting their own companies. Um, so there's a lot of competition amongst these providers. We do not get involved with who, what provider you want to use. Okay? If we get two providers showing up in the same house, and we've had fights in people's front yards oh believe it or not, um, uh, between providers. And when they show up like that, and we get bills for different providers in the home and all this kind of stuff, we stop, and we have to go back to the claim and say, what do you want here? Mm -hmm. Do you want this company in the home doing this, or do you want this company in the home doing this? They are asked to make that choice. They choose provider number two. We won't talk to provider number one anymore. They're cut off. We're going to send them a notice saying this person has chosen you, effect, or chosen this provider, effective this date, you're out. Okay. So if you are dealing with a situation where you're getting lots of competing offers for home health care, if you're serving as an advocate or a representative for somebody, you've got to go to that person and say, what do you want? You need to communicate that to the Department of Labor. Because if we get caught up in this mess, what's going to happen is, Something's going to trigger where we're not going to be able to figure out who's to be authorized for what, or we'll authorize somebody that shouldn't be there. I'm just asking anybody who's serving as a representative, if you want home health care and there's a dispute about what's going on in the case, talk to your client and find out what's going on and make sure that that information is then communicating to, to us. 